Okay. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us for this webinar on Open Knowledge Map with um, Peter Kramer. Um, I won't keep you long, I'm just a couple of housekeeping things. We'll be recording the webinar so you might be watching the recording and not be here live. Um, but anyone who's here will email the recording to you later so you can watch it in your own time and it will go on the Eiffel website as well. Um, there's a chat, bo a chat box on the right I think so if there's any questions you can put them in at any time but Peter said there'll be three times during the presentation where he'll stop and look at the questions and answer the questions so after the presentation and after the demo and at the very end but I'll keep an eye on the questions anyway in case it's not related to what Peter's saying and I can answer it I will do that um, and I think that's everything for me. So I'll disappear and I'll let um, Peter introduce himself properly and crack on. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to talk to you about Open Knowledge Maps today. Um, I'm the founder and chairman of the organization and I'll give you a, an introduction to Open Knowledge Maps. And then I also want to talk about the training materials that we have available and how you can introduce open knowledge maps to your community and we'll also look at our workshop concepts in particular our scientific scavenger hunt and um, yeah we're probably gonna do uh, one or two exercises just to get you an idea of how these things work let me quickly um, share my presentation All right, so now you should be able to see my screen. Um, and I'd like to start in uh, West Africa. In West Africa, we saw between 2014 and 2016, the worst outbreak of Ebola in human history. And this outbreak claimed the lives of 11,000 people or more than 11,000 people. And it hit three of the poorest countries in the world, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. And one of um, the most troubling facts about this outbreak is it could actually have been prevented using public scientific knowledge. Because one of the biggest problems back then was that the organizations, public health officials around the world thought that Ebola was not endemic to West Africa, so that it doesn't occur there. And that's why it took so long for the countermeasures to take effect because simply no one was prepared. And that's why so many people died. But as the New York Times found out in 2015, we were warned about Ebola and we were warned about Ebola in research papers. The authors of this article, they went through the databases and they found, for example, this statement. The results seem to indicate that Liberia has to be included in the Ebola virus endemic zone. And this caused a lot of dismay with the authors of this article, not because of the content of this statement, but when it was published in 1982, so more than 30 years before the catastrophe. And this was not the only article they found. They found several um, articles over the coming years that stated this very same fact. And I want to point out that this is not a problem of accessibility because the affected countries, they have access to these articles through certain programs such as Research for Life. And the large international bodies such as the World Health Organization uh, or Institut Pasteur, they have subscriptions to the relevant journals. So this is not a problem of accessibility. This is a problem of discoverability. And the authors of this article agree and they close with a saying from public health, the road to inaction is paved with research papers. And so I think we all feel a little bit like this poor person here, we're just swamped with the literature. 2.5 million articles are published each year and counting. And this makes it really difficult to get an overview of a scientific field. And once you have it, to then keep it. And this is difficult for people inside of 
academia, but it gets exponentially harder for everyone who is outside of academia. Think about the public health officials or journalists, practitioners, citizen science. They really don't have a gateway into science. And all of this is corroborated by the facts. So we see a high unsightedness of publications between 12 and 82 percent, depending on the discipline. It gets worse when we're looking at data sets. So this is a piece of research that I was also involved in. And we found that up to 85 percent of uh, research data sets are never cited. And where it gets really bleak is the transfer to practice, because even in an application oriented discipline such as medicine, it takes a long time for research to be transferred to practice, and only a very small amount ever is used in clinical practice. It has gotten so bad that a group of researchers around Jonathan Jeschke and the now president of the Austrian Science Fund, Clement Tockner, have coined the term dark knowledge. And dark knowledge doesn't refer to insidious or nefarious knowledge, if there is even such a thing, but it refers to public scientific knowledge that cannot be discovered and that cannot be reused. So this is knowledge that is hidden in plain sight. And what is even worse, the researchers assume that there is more dark knowledge than that there is knowledge that can be discovered and that can be re reused, and that the share of dark knowledge is actually rising. And this cancels out many of the positive effects that we were hoping for with increased accessibility to science and research. So we can conclude that there is a discoverability crisis and it negatively impacts the effectiveness and efficiency of science. And it also negatively impacts the transfer to practice. And ultimately, it can also risk human lives. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult to get an overview of a scientific field is the tools that we're using for discovery. Because search engines still reign supreme, and Google Scholar is king among them. But how do you actually get an overview of a scientific field using Google Scholar? What most people do is that they turn to the interface, they type in the name of the field, in this case, educational technology, and then they get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of results. And since you cannot read 2.5 million papers about educational technology, you turn to a highly cited overview work, go through this one, go through the references, maybe also look into the cited by to get newer articles. And with time and patience, you can then build a mental model of the field. That is, you know the most important topics, the most important authors, the most important publications. The downside of this approach, of course, is that it takes a very long time before this mental model emerges, weeks if not months. And this is not time that we have when disaster strikes. This is actually the time that we never have, unless it's maybe the first year of a PhD or something like that. And that's why there is a growing group of organizations, researchers, and tool makers who want to change that. And one of these organizations is Open Knowledge Maps. So who are we? We're a charitable nonprofit organization headquartered here in Vienna in Austria. And we're dedicated to dramatically improving the visibility of scientific knowledge. And we want to do that for science, but also for the other stakeholders in society. And our idea is to use knowledge maps for discovery. So in this example of heart diseases, you can see that it has many advantages over a list-based interface, that you can see the main areas at a glance, in this case, risk factors, types of diseases, and prevention. And relevant articles are already attached to each of these areas, so you can get immediately dive in and immediately get started. And our mission is now to create a visual interface that is based on knowledge maps. And we want to do that for all of science and research and really revolutionize the way we discover research. And finally, 
we also want to turn discovery into a collaborative process because right now it's something that we all do on our own and we all sort of have a piece of the puzzle in our head but it's very difficult to share this knowledge in a structured way so this is where we also want to um, make a change um, from uh, theory to practice. Um, I would like to give you a quick demo of um, our website, openknowledgemaps.org, where you can create a knowledge map of our own. I'm gonna quickly switch to my browser. And I believe I also have to, I also have to share this screen now with you. Yes. All right. So if you go to our website, openknowledgemaps.org, you can create a knowledge map of your own. And we have uh, two integrations. One is PubMed, the big database in the life sciences with a strong focus on biomedicine. And BASE, the Bielefeld Academic Search Engine, which has over 140 million scientific documents in its index and really search you, let, lets you search within our disciplines. And then you can type in a field that you're interested in. Let's for example, take digital education. And then you hit go and we create a knowledge map for you. As you can see, it looks very similar to the example that I showed you beforehand. So we have relevant sub areas as uh, bubbles in this case digital divide for example over here digital competence information technology and once you have identified an area that you're interested in for example let's say this one on digital literacy can zoom into it you can look at uh, the papers and the metadata also read the um, abstracts and if it's an open access paper, you can actually view it within the same interface. And um, we have also integrated an annotation tool, Hypothesis, which lets you annotate articles either for yourself or for the whole world to see. So the idea here is that you don't have to leave your browser tab if you want to do discovery. All right, I'm going to share the presentation again. One second. Okay, so the advantages that we see is that you can get a bird's eye view of a field that you can identify relevant concepts. So if you didn't know that digital literacy was a part of digital education, well, now you do. Sometimes that's the most difficult step in the whole discovery process to understand which words you're actually going to use for your search, for your discovery. You can sort the relevant from the irrelevant, uh, of course, always only pertaining to your information need. So if you're only interested, for example, in information technology, then you can stay within that bubble and branch out only later. And finally, um, Open Knowledge Maps is an interface over all scientific knowledge, open and closed. But we will always make it very easy to get to the open content. And we will um, always provide additional services like the annotation service for the open content. So how does it work? We um, use the 100 most relevant documents uh, from either BASE or PubMed. And relevancy is defined by the two sources. And essentially, it means the subject similarity between your query and the metadata of the documents. Then, then we um, uh, take these documents and we perform text similarity. So we look um, how many words these papers have in common in the metadata. And based on this um, text similarity analysis, we then perform clustering and layout algorithms that create the map. So papers that have more words in common will 
more likely be clustered together and they will also be closer on the map. We're open science all the way. So all of our content is CC BY, so the maps, you can share them, you can reuse them, you can modify them. All of our data is in the public domain, so the underlying structures of the knowledge map. And we uh, develop all of our software open source and uh, release it under an MIT license on GitHub. And we're also working towards participatory development. And one of these steps in this direction is that we have an open roadmap that you can all view and comment on. Many of you have already taken this opportunity and given us your feedback. Yeah, with this approach, we have become the largest visual search engine for research. And in the past two and a half years, we had more than a half a million visits on the website more than 100,000 maps were created, and more than 1,500 participants took part in the workshops and webinars and sessions that we conducted all around the world. When I say we, I mean a core team of dedicated, mostly volunteers, who are creating this um, system together with me. We also have an organizational member in the No Center, which is my previous institution. And recently, we were very happy to also welcome our first supporting member, the Ludwig Bortzmer Gesellschaft. We also found many advisors from the open science and open knowledge world, which guide us in the development of the tool and the organizations. Uh, many of them you will recognize, like Natalia Manora, who is the director of Open Air, Klaus Dochtermann, who is the director of ZBW, the Leibniz Information Center for Economics, or Bertil Dorch, who is the director of the Library of the University of Southern Denmark. We also have a community program, the Enthusiasts Program. And these uh, are ambassadors and power users of open knowledge maps. And they run workshops in their own communities, often in regions of the world where um, we can rarely travel to. And they introduce their communities to open knowledge maps and then bring the feedback back to us. So this is also where we're trying to include voices that may often be neglected and also include their needs and requirements in our roadmap. We also found many partners from the open science ecosystem um, because we see ourselves as a building block of this whole ecosystem. And there's, for example, our OpenSci who develop our data clients base, who is our main data source, but also um, training initiatives like the Open Science MOOC and preprint archives like AFRIC Archive. So I said um, that we're a building block and um, we're building block of what I would call the open discovery infrastructure. This is a technical infrastructure, a socio-technical infrastructure that allows, allows for reuse of resources. And that's why Open Knowledge Maps even exists. And to give you a little insight, I want to talk a bit about the workings of this infrastructure. So in the beginning, you have institutions, researchers, and publishers. And they contribute to libraries, archives, repositories, and aggregators, such as the ones on the right hand side. And all of these um, open uh, infrastructures, they now have a data interface, an open data interface, so other people can reuse the data. And this is where the meta aggregators come in. Um, infrastructures like open air, core, base, or Wikidata. And they create massive indices by harvesting all of the data and also providing, again, an open interface that other people can reuse. And this is where the value added services come in. We've already talked about open knowledge maps, but there are many others such as ORCID, Unpaywar, ContentMine, or Scoria. And together, they create a cycle of innovation. 
and uh, a cycle of continuous innovation. Because we can all build on top of each other. There are no walls between the different um, parts of this infrastructure. And there are many um, things that we don't always go the full circle, right? Sometimes we also build directly on PubMed. And sometimes, you know, an institution may also contribute directly to open air and so on. We also do a number of projects now with the open discovery infrastructure and uh, institutions and libraries that are really interested in open science. And uh, one of these projects is Viper, the Visual Project Explorer. This is something that uh, we did together with Open Air as part of one of their tender calls. We also working right now on a project together with the Austrian Academy of Sciences, which is called Linked Cut Plus, where we're creating a discovery interface for their early proceedings. And finally, we also worked on CRISPIS which is a visualization of research questions in mental health. So this institution, the Open Innovation in Science Center, the LBG, they created um, a crowdsourcing project for mental health questions. And many professionals, but also patients and relatives, they submitted research questions. And we created a visualization of that. So if you want to check out these projects, go to our website, openknowledgemaps.org, and click on the projects tab, and uh, then you can get more information and um, also uh, use these systems. And one of the most recent initiatives was uh, the GoFair implementation network on discovery, which we initiated. And there we want to increase the discoverability of data sets, because as we saw earlier, to 85% of data sets are not cited. Many of them are hidden in archives and it's hard to get them. And therefore, we have uh, started this implementation network to really think about the interfaces and the user-facing services that we need for dataset discovery. OK, um, at this point, I would like to pause for questions and comments. So let me switch back to Zoom. Hold on, I probably need to stop my screen share. Yes, so if you have um, any questions uh, towards open knowledge maps or any of the other things that I introduced, um, please type them into the chat and then I will answer them. So I can see any questions at the moment. And but. there's actually a question in the Q&A as opposed to the chat box. Ah. It says, you mentioned unpaywall, but does Open Knowledge Maps currently work used with unpaywall to identify open access content in the search results? So at the moment we don't, but it's on our roadmap. This is one of the things that we'd really like to implement in order to increase the number of open access items that people can immediately um, view and uh, work with um, on open knowledge maps. Okay. I don't see any other questions just now. All right. Yeah, whenever a question pops up, just type it into the chat or the Q&A and we can pick it up uh, later on in the webinar. Ah, there was one suggestion to work together with Google Scholar. Um, so unfortunately, this is not possible because Google Scholar doesn't allow anyone to reuse their data. In Google, Google Scholar, you can use it um, within the user interface, but as soon as you try to access their index um, programmatically, you will immediately shut out. And this is one of the problems with the kind of proprietary, proprietary systems that we have right now. So this is not only Google Scholar, but also Web of Science, Corpus, or ResearchGate. They only work within their own platform. And 
this makes it difficult for other people to create something innovative on top of these um, systems. And that's why it's so great that this uh, open discovery infrastructure is now emerging because um, it uh, enables uh, us to yeah, do new things um, and get away from this uh, list-based search. There is another question, um, can we use institutional repositories? Yes, absolutely. Um, so BASE is built on top of institutional repositories. They also have larger indices in their index, but um, uh, if you have a, a repository and it has an OAI PMH endpoint and it contains academic content, of course, then you can register it with BASE and um, your content will also be included there. So, in a sense, we really build on top of what repositories and libraries are already providing. Okay, excellent. Oh, I see there's another question um, in the Q&A. Oh yeah, um, so hello, it looks great. I hope I can integrate search engine to the side of my library. Um, yes, um, um, you can um, definitely link to it um, in terms of direct integration on your library website. Um, at the moment, I think it would probably be a bit difficult. So um, from the top of my head, I would suggest um, linking to it. But what you can always do is you can also embed knowledge maps. So there is an embed button next to the knowledge map and you can embed certain knowledge maps on your website. But I would definitely take this um, as a very good uh, pointer to something that we could develop. So you can have um, a search bar on your own website that then um, goes to open knowledge maps. All right, so if there are no more questions at this point, I would switch back to the presentation. All right, so yeah, I mentioned earlier that we are running the Enthusiasts program. And for the Enthusiasts program, um, we also created a lot of online materials for um, you to reuse. So if you go to our website, openknowledgemaps.org slash community hash training materials, you can find a number of uh, presentations and materials, including an overall Open Knowledge Maps presentation, then our two workshop concepts and further promotional materials. And um, I would like to now go to the website and simply give you an introduction to the materials that we have there. Again, I think I need to share a different screen. All right, so this, uh, these are the training materials on our website. So um, we have the presentation and if you go there, then uh, you redirect it to this screen. Let's switch to the list view. And um, we have two presentations, one in English and one in Spanish. And um, this presentation um, you can freely use and reuse. It's uh, licensed under CC BY. And um, it basically contains um, the presentation that I gave today. Um, give and take a few slides. And what we also tried to do is to give you very specific speaker notes. So. Um, to really enable you to um, give a good presentation and also uh, to give you all the information that you need um, when presenting the slides. 
We're also, of course, open to feedback. So if you think that uh, speaker notes are not sufficient at this point, um, please let us know. But uh, we really try to make it as easy as possible. We also included um, a short presentation, uh, a short introduction to open knowledge maps, uh, which you can use to announce the event or the workshop or whatever you're doing, maybe the presentation to um, your students, your colleagues. Um, and we tried to make it also customizable. You can then also find uh, a poster of open knowledge maps, which you can use um, to hang in your institution. And um, if you want to do more than a simple presentation of open knowledge maps, you could also run one of our two workshop concepts. And the oldest and uh, most uh, the longest running workshop concept is the scientific scavenger hunt, which we've done now all around the world. For the scientific scavenger hunt, you basically uh, you, you need a few things, which we have listed in this how-to here. And the idea is to introduce open knowledge maps to your community with the help of a game. And it's a mix between a pub quiz and a virtual scavenger hunt. So participants get together in groups and they try and complete tasks on open knowledge maps within a time limit. And uh, basically they follow hints um, on uh, the knowledge maps uh, that lead them to the correct answer. And then they write down the answer in this answer sheet, which we also provide here. And um, every two rounds, they swap the answer sheet with their neighboring groups and then they check um, who got it right. And um, we also provide you with a presentation for this format. And I think the easiest introduction is just to go through the presentation. And um, then I'd suggest that we also maybe do um, one of the questions um, to just give you a feel of how the game works. All right. So, yeah, for the scientific uh, scavenger hunt, people get together in groups of two to three, um, and they should have one laptop between them in the group. And then they agree on a team name, enter it on this answer sheet that I showed you beforehand, go to open knowledge maps and make themselves familiar with the search. And um, there are six, um, I call them boring rules to the game. So all questions have to be answered with the help of open knowledge maps. It's also not possible to answer them without open knowledge maps, but this is a, a good way um, to make sure that people don't try um, to answer it otherwise, because um, yeah, that's, that's, it's simply not possible. There's also a time limit for each question and uh, participants are asked to write down the answers on the sheets provided. Every two questions, they will swap it with the neighboring team to just check if they got it right. Teams get only points for fully correct answers. So sometimes there are several pieces of information that they need to write down. They only get the points if the, they um, answer them fully. And during the game, they can ask technical questions. So if they run into problems with open knowledge maps, um, then um, uh, they, of course they should be able to ask that question, but they shouldn't be able to ask questions about you know, the tasks in front of them. And then there's one exciting rule, which is uh, the winner gets a prize. And um, yeah, we suggest just getting a very small, simple price. It can be uh, a bar of chocolate or just something very small it can be also very geeky. Um, and it usually gets people very excited for the game um, and just a, a nice little thing to do. All right, so 
now I'd like to do with you um, the trial question. Hold on, I'm gonna make it a little bigger so I cannot see the answer. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe you'd like to do this question together with me. Um, so if you go to openknowledgemaps.org and um, then you type in air quality management and um, you also need to use the refine your search here and refine the date to, hold on, sorry, this was the wrong presentation. You need to refine the date to 1 January 1665 to 8 September 2017. Use base integration. And then you need to find the bubble that has to do with air pollution management. And in that bubble, um, then the idea is to find the answer to the following question. Which open source software has been used for multi-stakeholder engagement and the resolution of air quality issues? And um, usually participants get three uh, minutes for this question. So let's see um, if uh, one of the participants finds the correct answer. And I would say um, simply fastest uh, correct answer wins. Gonna see if I can pull up the chat here. gonna put the link into the chat so you don't have to type it in yourself if you want to try it there's a black box right in front of your can you move that Oh, sorry. Um, that was probably the, the Zoom interface that I just pulled up. I'm trying to do it as well, but I can't figure out how to adjust the dates. Oh, for the dates, um, you need to click on refine your search um, here and then go to custom range and then you can um, change the date. So you have to do that at the start, right? Yes. Ah, excellent. Yes, we have um, the correct answer in the chat and it is indeed open air. So um, if you go to openknowledgemaps.org and then um, go here to 8 September 2017. And uh, the query is, sorry, air pollution management. Um, 
and then uh, the knowledge map comes up and uh, now um, you need to find the bubble that says sorry all right let's tap through it very quickly that um, has to do with air pollution management oh <laughs> i already made a mistake this of course air quality management all right so we need this map and then we need to find a bubble on air pollution management and you can, can do that with the search so if you go up here and type in air pollution management it will filter the papers and it will also um, um, highlight the bubbles for you that um, contain these uh, the, the strings so air pollution management is here and um, then we have to find hold on um, the the paper which contains the following question which open source software has been used for multi-stakeholder engagement and the resolution of air quality issues and then um, you can go through the papers and um, look at the different metadata. And as you can see here, um, there is ut utilizing open air to support multi-stakeholder engagement and the resolution of air quality issues. So if you then go into the paper, then we'll also get the information that it is an open source air pollution analysis package. And that is the answer to that question. So, this is sort of a trial question to get um, people, give people a feel for the game. It's also maybe already on a bit of a higher difficulty level. So the um, the other questions they they start at a lower level of difficulty. Um, yeah, and then in the presentation we have included also um, some notes to help you. So it still make uh, people aware that it's still a beta version at this point, and sometimes things go wrong. Um, and also, you know, how can this, how can they deal with situations where things go wrong? Yeah, and then you go through the six questions, and in between you yeah measure the time and then move on and every two questions people will then swap the answer sheet mark the correct uh, answers and finally yeah you um, ask people to count the uh, the total scores and then you um, yeah try and find the winner by counting down from the maximum score, which is 60 to 55, and then you will find your winner. Sometimes there is two people who are winning, and um, then you, there are also um, decider questions, which you can use. And you in the decider question, we always play fastest wins. So the team that shouts the answer out first is the winner um, then at the end. So it's a really fun and engaging way of introducing open knowledge maps to your community. Um, we've done it many, many times and um, it's a workshop format that works really well. But we also noticed that there is another need uh, within the community and that is for um, researchers, this, this question, how can I make my research more discoverable within uh, discovery systems within search engines and for that we have developed um, the academic SEO workshop and again you will find uh, an introduction there which um, also tells you which oh sorry not this introduction um, we're again in the presentation here is the academic SEO workshop and um, again we have added a short introduction that gives you details of what you need for this workshop and then also a presentation that uh, you can use and essentially in this workshop 
Um, there are a lot of group discussions around um, certain topics. So for example, discovery practices, how do the participants use search engines at the moment? And then also discussions around Google Scholar and other search engines and how they actually index scientific knowledge. And there's always, of course, then um, the answers to these questions on the slides immediately after. Then there is an introduction to open knowledge maps. And finally, there are a lot of tips on how to improve one's own discoverability um, around the center around persistent identifiers, metadata, and openness. All right. Um, I think at this point, I'm also going to uh, pause for questions and see if you have anything that you would like to know with respect to open knowledge maps or the training materials. And um, there is one question, does it support Arabic repositories or Arabic research? So we don't limit the languages in open knowledge maps. You can search open knowledge maps in any language and we also include um, research from any language. That being said, we don't, we're not able to handle every language at the same level at the moment. So um, it can be that for um, other languages, the results aren't as good as they are for English. But we um, have, for example, a very strong community in Indonesia and um, they're um, search, often searching in their own language and um, this integration works very well for them. So if you are searching in your native language, please let us know. We really want to know whether Open Knowledge Maps works in your language and what the problems are so that we can address them going forward. Language is a very tricky thing for uh, search engines and discovery tools, uh, and it's difficult to get it right, but um, we definitely um, move into that direction of multilinguality and supporting different languages. Then there is a question, um, are all the repositories open access? Um, so the uh, answer is uh, no, usually it's mixed content. So I think base um, requires you to have at least some of your content to be open access, open access. Um, but open knowledge maps is an interface over all scientific knowledge, open and closed. Um, but we will always try to really um, highlight the open research and um, provide additional services for it. Any other questions at this point? Maybe in the Q and A, does not look like it. All right, um, then I'm going to take a look at the presentation and see where we are at. And um, yeah, now I'd like to show you a short video of um, how we envision this collaborative editing because as you may have noticed we don't have an edit button on open knowledge maps at this point and um, how this could work and how this collaborative discovery system could come about for that we have created a short video and that's what i would like to show you now Sarah is a first-year PhD student in biomedicine, starting her thesis on the Zika virus. Open Knowledge Maps has automatically created a map on the Zika virus for her. Sarah identifies a number of articles that warrant their own area. So she goes into edit mode. She adds a new area and drags the papers she found into the newly created bubble. She adds a title and places the area on the map. Sarah is interrupted by a message from a supervisor, Lauren. Lauren suggests a presentation related to the Zika virus that she's added to their joint Zotero group. 
Sarah connects OK Maps to her Zotero account and imports the presentation into her map. OK Maps automatically places the new content on the map. Sarah publishes and tweets the link of her map for other users to explore and modify on OK Maps. The next day, she fires up her email to see that fellow PhD student Amar has added several papers to her map. She also notices that Tom, who's working on a map on Aedis, has included her map as a submap of his. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the video and it gave you a certain insight into how we envision the future of open knowledge maps. And now I'd like to just conclude with um, two slides. And the first of them is that we're a community-driven and community-based initiative. So your su support really matters. Uh, please. Let us know what you think about open knowledge maps, whether you found it helpful uh, or whether you encountered problems or whether it didn't work in your language. Um, we want all the feedback and the input that you can give us. And you can find us on social media, um, Twitter, Facebook, you can write us an email, you can open an issue on GitHub. So there are many different channels that you can find on our website um, for you to give feedback. Yeah, if you um, have the time and you found Open Knowledge Maps useful, then consider introducing it to your students and colleagues. And uh, finally, we're always looking for new enthusiasts. Um, this iteration is now running, so but you can apply for the next iteration, which will most likely start early next year. Yeah, and if you want to stay up to date, don't forget to sign up for a newsletter, again on our website, you can easily um, find the sign up link for that. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, and I'm looking forward to your concluding questions, remarks, comments. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. That was great. Um, I think we do have a question in the Q&A. I don't know if you've seen that. The user creates the knowledge map. Exactly. So the question is, the user creates the knowledge map when he, she types the query or these knowledge maps are created before. Um, so we do create these knowledge maps on the fly. So when you type in um, your query, then we go to base and we ask them for the 100 most relevant documents on that um, query. And then we um, get everything onto our service and create the, not the knowledge map live. Um, and um, these knowledge maps are then stored on our server. So you can always come back to the same URL. And if you do the same query on the same day, we will also give you the cached version. So the one that's already in our database. So if you do the same query on a different day or in a different week, you could get a different map? Yes. So we always try to include um, the most recent research or um, try to also kind of um, um, show this dynamic um, nature of science. And so if you're doing this um, several weeks down the line, you will get a different map. Okay. So there's a comment from Anna, who's from Armenia. She says she used all the knowledge maps in her course last year and still using it. Awesome. No, ah, that's great. That's great. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I hope your students enjoy it. Yeah, and thanks for all the nice and kind words that uh, I see in the chat. That's very much appreciated. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I find it quite, it took me a while to get, I tried to do the question, but it took me a while to get started. Because <laughs> you're part, partly because we were watching your screen and I had to figure out 
how can I actually get into my own browser? But it's quite good fun. I know we were talking about doing like a live one um, and we were worried it wouldn't work. So it was good to have one question to try that. Um, yeah, and it's also, I mean, in the in the face-to-face -face setting, it usually um, works uh, quicker, but there's always um, some things that you need to get uh, acquainted to. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have the trial question so people can really settle in and it doesn't mm -hmm. immediately start. So we're trying, um, we, we don't, we try to not emphasize this uh, kind of competitive element to it, but rather really bring people on board and then mm -hmm. make it a fun experience for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, I'd, um, oh, there's another question that popped up in the Q&A. So the question is, in the example shown on air quality management, I realized some of the results came with PDF while others showed a link. What's the difference? So if you see the PDF button, then this is an open access paper and um, you can uh, see it in the same interface. Um, and if it's not, then it's, it's a closed paper and then we give you the link to the landing page or the repository so um, you can try and get it yourself. Okay. So then we have, I think, another question on, uh, so, oh yeah, students like the user-friendly interface. Yes, thank you very much. So we invest a lot of time in the user interface and really try to make this experience as uh, good as possible. Um, so that's always good to hear. And always, also if you find things, even if they're minor, just report them back to us because we really like um, polishing <laughs> our interface. And then there is the question, could you please repeat which um, CC attribution is better to use? Ah, that I think that refers to the academic SEO workshop. And there we um, usually advise people to use um, either CC BY or CC BY SA for papers and CC0 for data sets. And then we have another question in the Q&A this time. Does it work with Mendeley as well as with Sotero? So this is one of the things that's also on our roadmap that we want to improve the integration with uh, reference management systems. At the moment, you have to download the paper and then drag it into Sotero or Mendeley. Um, and um, this is something that we definitely want to improve because we know this is an important workflow. And that's why this year also the enthusiast program, um, the motto is integrating open knowledge maps into user workflows. And we really find to try to find out which of the use cases are most important mm -hmm. um, because we also we're a small nonprofit um, and we have to focus our activities. So we're trying to find out which are the use cases that are the most pertinent. And I think um, uh, reference management systems have a feeling that it will come up quite highly and then we will implement um, these use cases. There's another one in the Q&A on the vision for collaboration. I'm wondering if any user may not jumble up results in a new map which may confuse other users. Yeah, that's definitely something that we need to think very carefully about. Um, we know that this uh, can be a problem in, in other collaborative systems such as Wikipedia. And therefore, we would like to implement a system that enables users to add content, but that also um, has some moderation to it. And um, one way how it could turn out is that there is one map that's basically uh, a map where, where you can add anything and that very quickly changes and shows new dynamics all the time. And then there are very moderated maps that represent more or less a consensus among uh, a larger community of scholars. Okay, thanks. Well, I can't see any other questions and we've had a full hour, so I think we'll... Um, call it a day if that's okay with you <laughs> yeah absolutely um, obviously if there's any other questions maybe you can um 
I don't know if you want me to collect them and get in touch with you, if you want to leave your email on the screen so people can write them down, or I guess they can contact you through the website if other questions come up. Um, um, I'll put my email there in case anyone has any questions, I'm happy to forward them to you. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thanks for joining us. I think this has been really, really interesting. Um, and thanks for everyone. I think we've had about 30 people and probably another 30 that registered and will be watching the webinar at a different time. So that's quite good. And um, yeah, thank you. And uh, hope everyone has a good end of the day. <laughs> yeah, thank you also from my side. Um, I really enjoyed this. Um, thank you very much. Okay, take care everyone. Bye. Bye.